All right, I see people coming in now. I want to give you a couple of seconds to get situated and get started. <laughs> All right, hi everyone. My name is Jeff Frankel and I'm the manager editor of GEMS. Thank you so much for joining us today for a special Black History Month webcast, The Legacy of Freedom House, The Black Men Who Became America's First Paramedics. A big thank you goes to GEMS Training for sponsoring today's webcast. GEMS Training is our robust learning online platform built, for the, built to meet the needs of training for EMS professionals and agencies. We have over 100 hours of CEUs and the tools to track licenses, course completions, uh, research. I've never been easier with this, with this. Our courses are developed by the most renowned industry experts and improved by CAPSI. When this talk is over, head on over to GEMS Training at gemstraining.com to learn more. Now, before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. We are both live and interactive today. So feel free to, to ask uh, any questions you want in the Q&A box and we'll answer them in about real time. So uh, you can also enter any uh, questions you have about technical support. If you have any, any problems and a member of our team can assist you. We also recommend that you disable all block up, pop up blocking software um, to, to view this webcast. This webcast will be available on demand within 24 hours and you'll, you'll get a reminder email as well to your archive. You also find it at gems.com slash webcasts. Now I wanna introduce our speaker today. Uh, he, he really needs an introduction, I don't think. Uh, Chief Moon is a pioneer in EMS. He is a former Freedom House paramedic who retired as assistant chief of Pittsburgh EMS after 34 years. Chief Moon was the first paramedic to intubate a patient in the field and now spends his time making sure people know that Freedom House was really the building blocks of EMS in the US. So Chief, take it away. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Jeff. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to be here. Uh, it's actually fulfilling the desires of my heart to make sure that this part of history, uh, as we see it today, oftentimes we take for granted that's glorified on television, um, is remained in the forefront. And uh, so it's, it's I'm on this mission to make sure that this part of history is not forgotten. And in order for me to do that, I, I want to take our audience back in history. Um, we're going back to the 60s um, in a community that um, was somewhat underserved and neglected um, by the outside political environment or municipal government, uh, if you will. And um, I'm going to let you know how a organization uh, had a vision to change uh, something that was very important, and that was medical care in a Black community. And um, it all started, I would say, in the 60s when, uh, and I'm merely talking about Pittsburgh, where uh, unemployment was uh, relatively high, uh, housing uh, was at a dismal level, um, job training efforts were uh, somewhat non-existent, and, and unfortunately, uh, racism reared its ugly head during that time frame. So what you have here is a uh, community primarily that's underserved and neglected. <clears throat> and as we look at the screen, uh, you'll see uh, the name Freedom House. Uh, Freedom House was a, a, a nonprofit organization um, that was uh, created uh, by a community activist by the name of Jim McCoy. And uh, his prior job was, uh, he was a crane operator at uh, US Steel. So upon his, his retirement, uh, he became very active in the community and created an organization uh, called Freedom House, um, which during his time uh, was primarily responsible for voter registration, um, job training, job placement. Uh, there was even a, a, a mini food bank uh, in the organization. 
and <clears throat> a group of individuals uh, that were <clears throat> considered part of the board of directors at that time uh, came up with the vision. Uh, and in this community, uh, medical care was lacking. Uh, we, we had to uh, rely primarily on the police uh, to get you back and forth to the emergency room. Uh, and, and the drawback with that is that the community had a very adversarial relationship with the police. So if you can imagine back during this time in the 60s, a police wagon coming to your residence and um, for medical emergency, uh, they showed up whenever they felt like it, or if they didn't want to come, they simply uh, didn't come. And uh, the community itself uh, struggle with that. So if you can imagine a police wagon pulling to your, pulling up to your residence and two officers, which were predominantly white uh, at that time, there was no such thing as diversity and equity and inclusion. Uh, and they would place you in the back of a wagon onto a, a canvas cot. And both of them would get up front. Both officers would get up front of the vehicle and away you went. Uh, to the emergency room. The problem with that is that if something happened to you in the back, uh, let's say, for example, uh, you stopped breathing or your heart stopped beating, there was no one back there to uh, provide medical care for you. So oftentimes, you, when you arrived at the emergency room, as a result of the lack of care, uh, you were oftentimes worse off during that time frame. So here comes uh, Freedom House, which wanted to change the concept that was going on in the community, as well as the, the treatment that was being provided by uh, somewhat minimally trained police officers. And um, as I mentioned earlier, that was a mini food bank uh, there. So one of the visionaries who happened to be on the board of directors by the name of Phil Hallen, he was also director of the Maurice Falk Medical Fund, um, which was a foundation that distributed funds for needy uh, situations. He came up with the concept that if this community can deliver food to the residents of this neighborhood, which was underserved and somewhat neglected, why can't they deliver medical care? So he presented this idea to the board of directors and they obviously accepted it, but they didn't know how to get this uh, idea um, into fruition, because we're talking about in the 60s now, so nothing like this you see today ever existed. So they reached out to the local hospital, which was Presbyterian Hospital at that time, uh, and spoke to the director of the hospital, and he said, I have the perfect person to um, introduce you to. So he introduced uh, the Freedom House Board of Directors to a uh, anesthesiologist and the chief of the critical care medicine department at Presbyterian. His name was Dr. Peter Saffer. Now, Dr. Saffer at that time, uh, he was another visionary. He was trying to convince the outside world that it wasn't how fast you got the person to the emergency room that made the major determination, but what was being done for them prior to them getting there. But he had trouble getting his vision out to the world, out to the public. No one would believe him. So up comes this uh, group from Freedom House Ambulance Service, and they said to him, we, we want to kind of uh, create a system in our community because it's lacking medical care. We can't have residents to get back and forth to doctor's appointments and things. So we want someone trained to be able to do that. We can't continue to rely on the police because our needs are not being met. So Dr. Saffers thought, he said, this is the perfect platform to get my vision out to the world. So he agreed to train the individuals that Freedom House could come up with, and namely the trainees. And Freedom House had one requirement. He said, if you're going to train people from our community, every last one of them has to be blunt. So he agreed to that. So Freedom House, the organization itself, went out and recruited 25 
black men that had absolutely no concept of what to do outside of the hospital, no concept of, of medical treatment whatsoever. And he placed them into the most intense training environment that had ever been done. Uh, we spent time in the emergency room, in the intensive care unit, uh, in the operating room uh, with the IV team and the cardiac care unit. Uh, we even spent time in the obstetric uh, ward of a local hospital assisting in the delivery of, of, of infants. Uh, we were taught CPR. Uh, and we even spent time in the county morgue uh, addressing anatomy and physiology. So it was roughly about 300 hours of training that, that Freedom House's trainees had to go through. And it was the most intense training that had ever been done. Um, and keep in mind that we weren't necessarily observing. We were actually treating patients in those respective units. So once that was done... These individuals, we were placed uh, in vehicles, uh, namely vans, because at that time, police were the primary transport unit. So we had to purchase vans and design them exclusively for the need that we wanted. Today, if you look at an EMS unit, the seat at the head of the patient, we designed that at Freedom House with the assistance of Dr. Saffer the onboard suction unit, the onboard oxygen, oxygen unit, the uh, BP cuff. Uh, so we helped design the interior component of the, the, the ambulance as you see it today, uh, as well as the equipment, the medications that are on there. So that's where this vision all began. And, and the interesting thing about that is we had two levels, two challenges. We had to train the emergency room to receive patients coming in with an IV or with a heart monitor on, or, or basically that already been given medications or someone performing CPR on them. We were the first to take CPR out of the hospital and into the street. Um, and in doing that, we had to teach the emergency rooms this is what, number one, we're doing, but we don't know, but this may be what's going to happen in the future. But we're so living, much living in the moment that we are more concerned about serving a neglected, underserved neighborhood. In addition to that, we also had to train or teach the community itself that this is who we are. This is what we do. Because in their mind, you had to just come and pick them up and take them to the hospital. And we had to change that mindset within the community. And fortunately for us, we were able to do that. And, and, and in doing that, basically, we created the very first pre-hospital EMS system that's actually glorified uh, on television, that's copied around the world, the foundation of every EMS system in this country rest on the shoulders of Freedom House Ambulance Service. Now, we basically operated from, I would say, 1967 till 1975. And during that time, we probably handled roughly about 50,000 uh, calls. And you, you keep in mind that nothing like this was ever done before. So we were restricted to our various communities, and we couldn't go outside of that to provide it. So the city of Pittsburgh itself was concerned about the business community. So they entered into an agreement uh, with Freedom House Ambulance Service to basically provide pre-hospital care to the business community, which was downtown Pittsburgh. So you have the Hill District, the Oakland area, are receiving pre-hospital care as well as the business district. And, and that sustained itself for roughly about seven, seven and a half, almost eight years. And we became the norm. Now, Dr. Saffer, um, at the time, he really didn't have a whole lot of time to, to spend with Freedom House's paramedics. Um, 
because he had to, he was wearing multiple hats, uh, critical care medicine chairperson, uh, chief anesthesiologist. So what he uh, did is he recruited um, different doctors to be medical directors of Freedom House Ambulance Service. And that was great. But the problem that existed with that is the medical directors that he recruited only remained with Freedom House maybe a year, a uh, year and a half at the most. And then they would leave and pad their resumes and move on to bigger and better things. So as a result of white male doctors coming in and, and somewhat pretending to be the medical director of Freedom House and moving on, we grew accustomed to that at Freedom House. And unfortunately, since we are, were accustomed to it, we, at that time, developed a mistrust for people outside of Freedom House or physicians coming in. Here's this white male coming in. He's going to pad his resume and uh, move on to the next step. And, and that was the norm. Until one day, uh, Freedom House, uh, as well as Dr. Saffer, recruited a young lady by the name of Nancy Caroline. And Nancy Caroline uh, was coming to Pittsburgh to do a fellowship under the leadership of Dr. Peter Saffer. And in doing that, he introduced her to Freedom House. She had never heard of us. She had never heard of the terminology of paramedics or EMTs. Uh, so she came in with blinders on. And in addition to that, what she came in with is she came to an organization where there was a lack of trust. Because remember, we were used to people coming in and padding their resume and, and moving on to, to bigger and better things. And we looked at Nancy Caroline the same way. But what we didn't know is that Nancy Caroline was different. Even though we didn't trust her, she knew from the outset that she had to earn our trust. And in order to do that, she had to spend time with us. So she was committed to spending time with each and every person at Freedom House. I'm talking about seven days a week, 24 hours a day. In the wee hours of the morning, she would call on the radio and challenge us on, on uh, what we had done for the, the patient or why we didn't perhaps start an IV or what was the EKG reading and things of that nature. So we got accustomed to, 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 to dealing with Dr. Nancy Caroline. And all during this transition period, she was earning our trust. We were teaching her on what it was like to be in this free hospital care environment, number one. And we were also exposing her to the challenges that and the hurdles and barriers that we had to, to deal with on, on a day-to-day -day basis. So doc, Dr. Caroline, in turn, we had to prove to her that she would feel confident in, in, in being our medical director and the skills, things that she wanted us to do, that we were capable of doing it. So once these two, this partnership of mistrust and, and, and lack of confidence turned to trust and, and confidence, basically, it was almost like a marriage made in heaven. We took Dr. Caroline everywhere. She spent time with us. Uh, she wasn't afraid to be seen with us or ashamed to be seen with us. Uh, she was able to open doors in different specialty units that we were not allowed uh, to get into. Uh, the best example I can uh, give you is, and we're going back to the 60s, so I want you to try to picture this in your head. Think of a five foot two Jewish woman uh, walking down the halls of a hospital with four black guys with white uniforms and afros and beards. That is the vision that we had, walking right into an intensive care unit, not stopping at the desk, announcing we're here, not getting permission, but walking right to the patient's bedside and, and, and being questioned on the type of medication. Uh, what was the EKG reading? Listen to the lung sound. What do you hear? What is the side effects of this particular medication? What's the IV rate? 
uh, all of these different things she was actually teaching us uh, on, on, on how to treat them. And out of that was born an actual uh, love relationship. Uh, and during that time, what we uh, didn't envision is that Nancy Caroline wanted to not only make Freedom House better, she wanted to prove to us that we could, you know, design a system that no one else was actually using and have it be the standard uh, for EMS system across this country. And in doing that, she uh, sent a request in through the federal government, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, to get a grant to write a paramedic training manual using Freedom House's personnel. And that's how the manual uh, emergency care in the street uh, was born. Uh, we primarily uh, had to prove in order to write that manual, we had to show that every technique, every skill, every bit of knowledge in that manual, we had to uh, fulfill. And, and in doing that, we were able to write the very first paramedic manual uh, that every paramedic in the United States was required to read, emergency care in the street. That became the standard. And uh, it's the standard even uh, today, even though there's additional bits of information added to it and things are taken out of it and things like that. And, and if you look at the very first, uh, I would say first three editions in there, Freedom House is acknowledged as the source of the information, the source of the training and things. But unfortunately, as more editions are, are, are being uh, produced, Freedom House is, is slowly wiped out of any mention to that. Um, I looked at uh, perhaps edition number nine one time and and I'm, I'm looking in it and, and going through the history of EMS and 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 it talks about uh, Jacksonville and Seattle and Miami and Los Angeles, how great those systems are and 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 what they've been able to accomplish. And then there's a little short excerpt about Freedom House, and it says Dr. Nancy Caroline was a medical director, um, and Freedom House was composed of a group of Black men that didn't have an opportunity to get a high school education. And that's it despite the fact that we wrote the book. So those are the types of things that I, I, I want to, to bring to the surface that history itself is trying to, to erase or, or eliminate. Now, I, I mentioned earlier that Freedom House itself lasted from 1967 to 1975. Uh, we were only restricted to providing service to a, uh, a predominantly Black, underserved, neglected neighborhood. What you have here is that people in your more affluent neighborhoods, I would say, uh, noticed that the people in the Hill District were getting better medical care than they were. And they voiced their concerns to the political powers uh, within the city at that time, and namely the mayor. So uh, an example would be, uh, how dare you allow those poor people over there in that rundown neighborhood have better medical care than, than I do. I own this business. I voted for you. I contributed to your campaign. Uh, I own this million dollar home. Um, I'm an upstanding member in the community. How dare you allow this to occur? So they voiced their concerns to the mayor. And for him, he had to bow to the wishes of his constituents. And when he did that, there was no room in his plan for an entity such as Freedom House. So instead of expanding Freedom House as you see it today, um, he decided to start his own. Now, what I want to do as, as we are talking here, 
I want to try and give you a glimpse of the importance of Freedom House. I have a short video here that I'm trying to bring up that I want you to see. And as you're looking at this video, I want you to try and understand how far ahead of our time that we were. Chief, if you don't mind, you know, might have to jump in and ask a question. Yes, please. I think we'll get the ball rolling. You know, folks, anyone in the audience, please ask away from live. My question is, did you know at the time you were making history, all of you, or just another day, another job for you? Did you know did it, you know it was special? That that's that's an excellent question. At the time, um, we did not, um, and one of the reasons we were so caught up in the moment. Uh, providing care to an underserved community, that that was our our overall focus. And we had no knowledge at that time or even considered uh, what we were doing was groundbreaking or history making and things like that. And that that to me, that's the the beauty of of what um, we had to to deal with. We were so busy taking care of this community. Uh, we made sure that the community um, had uh, transportation back and forth to your doctor's appointments and things like that. If you were immobile and uh, you had a doctor's appointment, we would come and take you and take you to the physician's office or wherever and then come back and pick you up at a designated time. Uh, so we were really a complete system in addition to being uh, inter-hospital transports, we also handle emergency calls uh, during that time. But as far as us saying, okay, we're trying to develop this and trying to develop that, uh, no, uh, that was just all a part of doing our job on a day-to-day -day basis. I You're bet. Absolutely correct. Bet. Uh, we, we another question for audience. Yeah. Since PadMax didn't exist yet, what kind of textbooks, textbooks did you use to study? Well, what we were doing primarily is using the practical application more so than anything else. Uh, an example would be uh, when we were doing uh, internships uh, in the emergency room, basically. Uh, a lot of it was hands-on. Uh, we had classes that uh, we would have lecturers come in uh, uh, primarily physicians, uh, to teach us, say, 
a particular skill, uh, CPR, uh, tracheal intubation, uh, EKGs, and things like that. Uh, and naturally, the, the manual itself didn't exist, but you had kind of bits and pieces of information that was written down and things like that, that they could actually uh, do a presentation for from, as, as well as, you know, those, those items were passed out uh, to us. But as far as the books themselves um, about paramedics in general, no. Uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration uh, issued a grant for us to, to write the very first paramedic manual. Mm -hmm. And if you had to guess, how many were were there of you, and w was only men or women too? Initially, uh, when the class first started, uh, there were twenty five uh, men, and as the service continued to uh, exist, uh, we uh, started hiring uh, females, uh, EMTs, uh, and and they worked in the field uh, just like. Uh, the other personnel uh, did, but we also had um, the majority of the female were dispatchers. So uh, the service, we were actually based at Presbyterian Hospital. And uh, we uh, responded from there uh, to emergencies as well as another local hospital in the community, emergency, uh, Mercy Hospital, as well as Montefiore. So we we divided the area up into three different segments. And depending on where the call was, um, that was the unit that was dispatched. Hmm. Interesting. And how about this? How about before Freedom House? Were, did funeral homes in the area provide services, ambulance services? or the, the funeral homes themselves were primarily, I would say, in your outlying areas outside of uh, the city, uh, the city of Pittsburgh solely had to 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 rely uh, on the police. Mm -hmm. um, at that particular time, uh, as I look back, they were minimally trained by the very nature of of what they were doing, and and no one envisioned that th someone could be trained in a higher level of training at that particular time until Freedom House uh, merged with uh, Dr. Peter Safford to create that. Interesting, okay. This is a good question from uh, a Daniel Taylor. At the time, were you or any other founders of Freedom House aware of other communities, communities of color who were creating systems in response to some issues in Pittsburgh? For example, the Black Panther Party, ambulance service in Winston-Salem, North Carolina? Also, part two, was there any communication, collaboration, information, information sharing between two groups? Um, the answer to both to both questions is no. Mm -hmm. um, at that particular time, um, there was really no standard of training uh, that I would say a system wide standard of training, um, and primarily. Uh, our training was somewhat, um, I, 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 I can't think of another term, but I'll just say superior for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. uh, because the society as a whole uh, didn't realize the importance of bringing the emergency room to the person. And that's the difference. In, in, in what you see today is we were the first to actually bring the emergency room to the person. Uh, a lot The police itself was primarily a transport unit. And, and with the assistance and training of Dr. Saffron and Dr. Nancy Caroline, we created a different spectrum where we brought the emergency room from the hospital to the patient. Mm -hmm. And that had never been done before. Great, great. All right, this time, I'll let you finish some more slides. and. People in the audience could ask more questions, and I'll pop up. I'll pop back on in a few minutes. Sound good, Chief? Okay. Thanks. The slide you're looking at now um, is Dr. Peter Saffer in the lower left, Dr. Nancy Caroline uh, in the middle there and to the far right, and um, 
Phil Esposito. Uh, he was part of the board of directors uh, of Freedom House, and he had his own EMS system, but it was patterned after uh, what we were doing at Freedom House. So it was a mobile, we were essentially a mobile intensive care unit. Uh, Dr. Saffer, uh, the beauty with him is he was nominated three times for the Nobel Peace Prize. So you're looking at a person that um, had a vision to take care out of the hospital, out of the emergency room, away from there to the person's home uh, with the utilization of CPR. Um, he died in 2003. Uh, Dr. Nancy Caroline, uh, once Freedom House dissolved, and I'll get into that, uh, she died in 2002. Uh, but before she did that, we were able to uh, write the manual. But uh, both of these individuals have a very special meaning uh, to each and every person that worked at Freedom House. If you remember back, I told you a gentleman that had a vision and the visionary on my left here is uh, Phil Howland. Uh, he's still with us today. He's 93 years old and he still gets around. And I, you know, actually uh, interact with him at least once a week. So, uh, and to your right is Dr. Peter Safford. So you're looking at two visionaries uh, here uh, that were primarily responsible uh, for pre-hospital care as uh, we see it today. This is one of the earlier versions of uh, Freedom House ambulances uh, with uh, three of the paramedics uh, there. Um, and if you look, this is a great picture. If you look at all the equipment that's in this vehicle, I talked to you about the BP cup, the onboard suction unit, the onboard oxygen. Uh, we designed all of that, the seat at the head of the patient where the gentleman is sitting. Uh, the uh, gentleman right there on the stretcher is Phil Howland. Uh, he has offered his services to be uh, a pretend patient. And to your left there is the very first heart monitor that we could take uh, out into the field. It weighed roughly about 60 pounds. Uh, so imagine carrying that into a person's home. Uh, as you can see, there's headroom in the vehicle along with the equipment along the upper shelves uh, there, as well as you see a paramedic taking uh, Phil's blood pressure. Uh, this is merely uh, a picture of the, the unit itself. Um, as we moved on, we started getting additional new units and things, but you're looking at the, the complete design of one of the first uh, paramedic units. And these are two individuals that are uh, carrying a patient from a high school. Uh, and it's something that I don't know what the paramedics have on their vehicles. It's called a Reeves stretcher. Uh, it's a collapsible stretcher that uh, was probably used. I don't know whether it's used anymore now, uh, but primarily used uh, to bring people up and down the steps as opposed to using a regular stretcher. It's a picture of Dr. Nancy Caroline, and even today, uh, 20 years later, I, I still miss her. Uh, she was just a special person. Uh, this slide here is interesting because somewhere around 1974, the tides, the winds started shifting. Uh, remember, I told you earlier that the mayor had to bow to the wishes of his constituents. So what he did is he created his own EMS system. But before he did that, um, Freedom House took one last ditch effort to save itself, where we um, offered a, a disaster drill in downtown Pittsburgh doing a critical care medicine conference. So a lot of your uh, specialists in critical care medicine were in town for this conference. And we uh, instituted a, a disaster drill where we uh, treated, obviously, 
uh, patients on the scene prior to transporting them. And you see Dr. Nancy Caroline is, is obviously in the forefront over that. And that went on like clockwork. And basically, it was very much uh, received. I told you uh, we designed the very first paramedic manual. It's called Emergency Care in the Streets. And I, I, I talked about how uh, Freedom House was suddenly removed uh, from being mentioned in additional uh, editions of this book. But this is the very first paramedic manual. This is the first edition. This book is probably about 47 years old. Uh, and I that's my copy. And it's very near and dear to me. This is the monitor that I, I mentioned to you uh, that we had to utilize back then. As you can see, the very small screen uh, that we had, and naturally your defibrillator paddles. Uh, a lot of this stuff is in the Heinz History Museum of Natural History, which is part of the Smithsonian. Now, this is a very interesting uh, slide here. Right now, this country is in an opioid crisis, and the drug of choice to treat that is, is Narcan and Naloxone, and, and it's this wonder drug. Everybody has it. Uh, you can buy it over the counter. Addicts themselves carry it. First responders, firefighters, police, paramedics, uh, citizens carry Narcan. And, and right now, the, the world sees it as this wonder drug. But what people don't know is Freedom House administered Narcan back in 1973. We were the very first to take it out of the hospital, out of the emergency room or the operating room and take it out into the field to treat heroin overdoses. There was no such thing as fentanyl uh, back then. But yeah, we took Narcan out of the hospital and we, we gave it in a very ingenious way. Uh, we did not want any of our drug overdoses to wake up and it was by design. So we, if I can draw you this picture, we gradually administered the drug via IV. So we would start an IV of perhaps uh, 250 of uh, D5 and W, and we would kind of give them a Narcan drip and we would monitor their breathing. If the breathing slowed down, we would speed it up. And if they stopped, we would obviously breathe for them. And we kept you in a more confused day state until we got you into the emergency room because we really didn't want you to wake up uh, in the back of our vehicle, somewhat you would become combative or argumentative um, or even go through withdrawals. So we didn't have those kind of problems uh, as far as uh, treating uh, drug overdoses. Now, this is interesting. Uh, as you can see, this is a tracheal intubation kit. It's a modern day tracheal intubation kit. And I say that because right now, I am the first person that did not have an MD behind their name or a PhD or a res surgical resident to take tracheal intubation away from the hospital out into the field to do it in a person's home. And it was a, a, a very interesting concept when I did it. We had practiced it on mannequins uh, numerous times. So I went was called to go into the operating room of Presbyterian Hospital. They didn't tell me why I was there. So I walked there, and the minute I entered the door, everything stopped. The surgeon stopped doing what he was doing. The uh, uh, anesthesiologist who was sitting at the head of the patient uh, looked up to see who was there. And I was standing there with the head of the department, Dr. Saffer. The aura technician stopped what they were doing, and everyone was looking at me. And one of the reasons I found out that occurred is, is the only time you would see someone that looked like me, namely a black, coming into an operating room was with a mop or a bucket. But I didn't have that. I walked in with the head of the department and he went directly over to uh, the head of the patient where the anesthesiologist was sitting they had already issued, uh, given the patient Karari and paralyzed their breathing. And he told the person to get out. And he said, you sit down and intubate the patient. And I did. And at that time, I knew people were watching me. They had amphitheaters at that time. But I didn't see them when I performed this procedure. 
So I did it immediately the correct way the first time because failure was not an option. At the time, we were actually writing the paramedic manual. So I had to succeed. And as a result of that, we went from room to room doing tracheal intubations on suspecting patients. Little did I know, less than a week later, I would take that same skill out into the field to perform it in a patient's home. It had never been done before. Now that presented its own unique set of challenges because when I did it and we transported the patient to the emergency room, I got challenged by the physician who intubated this patient, who told you to do it, and who are you? So I had to explain to him that uh, our medical director was Dr. Nancy Caroline. She instructed me to intubate the patient, and I worked for Freedom House Ambulance Service. So that itself is a skill that we had to teach the emergency rooms uh, to be aware of a patient coming in already intubated because it had never been done before. And so we had to teach the surrounding emergency rooms to be aware of that. Military anti-shock trousers, better known as the mass suit. Uh, we used those and they presented a set of challenges primarily because uh, the emergency room were not used to it. So they would either cut them off or just totally rip them off and, and put your patient back into hypolimbic shock. So we kind of had to guard them with our life every time we brought a patient in uh, with them. Now, this is uh, your host. That's me. I was uh, roughly about 22 years old at that time, uh, <clears throat> doing an interview with a, a movie production company about you know my experience uh, at Freedom House. That's Freedom House's emblem. Uh, <clears throat> that's very special to me because one of my goals when I worked for City of Pittsburgh is I wanted every one of these emblems placed on Pittsburgh paramedic units, ambulances, in honor of Freedom House. Uh, I actually got a city council ordinance to have that done. Uh, unfortunately, uh, once I left, they got new trucks and uh, the emblems themselves uh, are on very few of them if any. Now, this gentleman here is very interesting because <clears throat> Freedom House's personnel, we were looked at a group of unemployables, least likely to succeed, society's throwaways, if you will. But if I have to think about that, I, I would say society made one mistake. It didn't tell us. So we went about creating a system that's emulated today uh, on television across this country. Now, this gentleman that you're looking at at this slide, he did not come with the city. Instead, he went to Cleveland, Ohio, and designed their EMS system. He also became the public safety director for the state of Ohio. Then he moved to Columbus and became uh, the public safety director for Columbus, Ohio. His name is Mitchell Brown. Uh, I keep in close contact with him. Uh, he also became uh, a member of the city council uh, in Columbus, Ohio. And they have a brand new fire station named after him, the Mitchell Brown Fire Station number. I can't remember the number. Uh, that was uh, built in 2015. Uh, and I had the privilege of, of going myself and Phil Howland going to Columbus uh, during his retirement. And this new fire station was built uh, in his honor. Quite an accomplishment for someone that society deemed unemployable and the least likely to succeed. This is one of uh, Freedom House's ambulance service vehicles with Dr. Nancy Caroline and one of the paramedics. Now, this is an interesting photo because if you look at the photo, you will see perhaps missing trim along, around the door and maybe some rust spots here. And maybe the hubcaps are missing and the tires look a little worn. And, and I have no doubt you would probably say I would never go anywhere in that truck. But that truck 
and you would probably never see it in an EMS system today. But that vehicle has a special meaning uh, because when I look at it, I don't see those things. I see perseverance. I see resiliency. I see determination. I see motivation. So we were a group of individuals that knew we had to provide a service to an underserved community at all costs. And, you know, it's amazing when I look at that truck as to uh, what we were able to accomplish, even in that mindset. This is the group of paramedics, as you see to the left is uh, Dr. Saffer, in the center is Dr. Nancy Caroline. Uh, this is handsome Chief Moon, uh, right there in the, the very middle there. Uh, and this is uh, the administrative staff of uh, Freedom House Ambulance Service, along with uh, its core paramedics and uh, dispatchers. This is one of the city of Pittsburgh paramedic, uh, brand new vehicles. As you can see, the Freedom House emblem is there. And this is my good friend, Phil Howland. It was his vision to create an EMS system. And that's what Pittsburgh EMS's vehicles look like today. They're not all uh, this new and shiny, but this one hadn't been put out on the street yet. So uh, we were looking at it. This is that other Hampson guy, John Moon. This is just a photo of me when I worked uh, for Pittsburgh EMS. Uh, I began as a paramedic, uh, went to crew chief, uh, division chief, chief supervisor, assistant chief, and I retired in 2009 as uh, the assistant chief for Pittsburgh EMS. Now, this is an interesting photo. This is me again. I am the only one in the history of the Public Safety Department for the City of Pittsburgh to actually complete the Master Scuba Diver Training Program. As you can see, there are other divers. Obviously, I'm the only one that looks like me that was in the class. So I obtained the Master Scuba Diving uh, Certification uh, during my time at Pittsburgh EMS. In Pittsburgh EMS, the system is unique because Pittsburgh EMS handles uh, water rescue, hazmat, uh, vehicle rescue, so we're well-rounded uh, service. That's just another picture of myself posing when I was the assistant chief. This is a very beautiful picture. And what this does is, this is Deputy Chief Amir Gilchrist. Now, what makes her special is that during my 34 years there, there has never been an African-American chief of Pittsburgh EMS. She walked in to my office off the street and said, I'm looking for a job. And at the time I was responsible for recruiting and hiring. So I offered her a position as an EMT because at that time we had a two tiered system. So she took the position when a paramedic position opened up she moved up to a paramedic ranks. Then she became a crew chief. Then she became a division chief. Then she became an assistant chief. Then she became deputy chief. And today she is the first African-American chief of Pittsburgh EMS. Um, 25 years ago when I interviewed her, I never knew or didn't envision that I was actually interviewing the first African-American chief of Pittsburgh EMS. So she's my crowning moment within Pittsburgh EMS. And she's still there today. Uh, we are very close. And she credits her career uh, to Freedom House. This is uh, our book uh, with Kevin Hazard and myself, the book American Sirens, which is obviously doing very well. Uh, it took us about four years uh, to write this book. Uh, and I encourage you all to get it because it chronicles the history of EMS that you see today and also my life growing up uh, when I was a young child. Once again, 
I can't thank you all enough. I'm really honored and appreciated for this opportunity to pre present this forgotten part of history. And uh, I'm now open for questions. Chief, thank you so much. Bravo to you, everyone else at Freedom House. What a story. We've come a, we've come a long way, and I'm sure we still have a long way to go, but <laughs> thank you again for this. Um, folks, please ask questions. Um, first one from uh, Alan. Uh, did other public safety agencies in Pittsburgh cooperate with Freedom House out in the field? I know you mentioned that police were there, but what, what else? Um, that's an excellent question because in order to answer that, I have to give you uh, the concept. If you remember back during my presentation, I mentioned the mayor created his own EMS system. And in doing that, there was no room in it for an entity such as Freedom House. So what he did, he just couldn't wipe the service off. So he systematically came up with a plan on how to do it. And can you imagine an ambulance going on a call and not being allowed to use its lights and sirens. Freedom House was issued an executive order from the mayor saying when you go into this particular location, you are not allowed to use your lights and sirens. So we would have to stop at a light and wait for it to change and move to the next one. That impacted response times. The second thing was he, we had an agreement. Uh, we had a contract. Uh, with the city of Pittsburgh to provide pre-hospital care to the business district. And that contract was worth roughly about $50,000, and that was a lot of money back then. So every January, we expected a check of roughly about $50,000. So he decided that I'll give it to you whenever I feel like it. So maybe in January, he gave us $10,000, and maybe March, another five, and then April, another 10. So that in itself impacted our payroll. So we had to reach out to, to, to different foundations for funding and things like that. So he also, in creating his own EMS system, he basically brought in an all white system from the suburbs. So they came into an urban environment with an entirely different mindset. This was the most dangerous place in the world to be. So they came in with weapons and knives and guns and things like that that they kept in their cars. The trucks themselves, when Pittsburgh EMS first started in 1975, had handcuffs on them. Uh, we were dressed just like the police at that particular time. So it was nothing for a Pittsburgh EMS truck to pull up alongside a car that perhaps went through a stop sign and yell at the driver because that was the mindset. Uh, in addition to that, there were seven cell flashlights on the truck, not to find your way around in the dark, but to use as a protective mechanism because we're coming into this urban environment. Along with that stereotypical mindset, the paramedics were taught that you don't have serious medical calls in underserved communities. Your public housing complexes, uh, as an example, the only call you're going to get there is domestic violence, drug addiction, shootings, uh, and things of that nature. Your medical calls are going to come from the affluent neighborhoods in the city. So if you want to deal with the medical calls, make sure you're assigned to uh, a unit that handles an affluent neighborhood outside of that area. So in doing that, you had a stereotypical typical mindset. Now, the mayor couldn't just drop Freedom House. So he agreed to take its people, its equipment, and, and, and merge them all with the city system. So the, the, the agreement said, I have to take you, but it didn't say I had to keep you. So they designed a systematic way of eliminating as many of Freedom House's employees as humanly possible. 80% of them were terminated. And the theory behind that, and that's why I understand when, and even though it saddens me, I still understand when people never heard of Freedom House, is if you get rid of the history makers, you essentially get rid of that part of history that they made. So the city of Pittsburgh EMS, and don't get me wrong, I'm not a disgruntled 
former assistant chief of Pittsburgh EMS. I love the department. I love the people that work there and will always have a special place in my heart. But we're talking about different times. So the department went on this effort to eliminate as many of Freedom House's people as they possibly can. Uh, you, Myself included. Even though I was the first person to ever do a tracheal intubation in the field, I came in as an observer. I couldn't drive the truck. I couldn't talk on the radio. I couldn't examine the patients. Couldn't do anything in an effort to frustrate me into saying, you, you, look, I don't need to deal with this anymore. And as fate would have it, I went on a call with the crew that I was working with, and we walked into a person's home, and the person was unconscious, not breathing, and didn't have a heartbeat. And the crew that I was working with didn't know what to do. They panicked. And they looked at the person who wasn't allowed to do anything and say, you take over. So once I started assigning responsibilities, you 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 put the monitor on, you start an IV and I'll do the intubation. Uh, we saved the person's life and that was great. But it had to be kept quiet because I wasn't allowed to do anything. At that point in time, I had to make a decision. Do you continue in this passive mindset, a passive environment, or do you step up your game and be more assertive, more aggressive? So I chose to do the latter. I wanted this department to know exactly who John Moon was at that time. And uh, fortunately, I was able to accomplish that goal, uh, not without his challenges or hurdles or anything like that. <laughs> The chat is filled with questions. We won't get all of them today because I want to be mindful of people's time. I know we're probably, on the, if, you're, if you're working today, you're probably on, on the rig working or wherever you are. So one last question for, for Chief Moon, because I think it's a great way to end this. What can the next generation of first responders focus on in order to, to best carry forward Freedom House's legacy of innovative and courageous care? That That's a great, great question. And um, if I can, I'll try to get this in quick. When I worked at the city of Pittsburgh, uh, the department kept steadily becoming white males. When it started, it was 98% white males. Uh, we uh, went 10 years without hiring an African-American. So I voiced my concerns to, to my bosses and I designed the very first diversity recruitment program in the city of Pittsburgh. And I did that based on how Freedom House worked. I went out into the community and recruited people that had no concept, no idea what an EMT or a paramedic was, placed them into a training program and, and paid them to go. And since the department was paying them and investing in them, they were guaranteed jobs. And all while I was there, that was a normal way. So my answer to that question is EMS systems today have to invest in the community in which they serve. That's where your allies are. So if you invest in the community in which you serve, you'll obviously, I believe, and I'm a firm believer of this, solve the shortages of, of personnel, as well as you'll somewhat solve your diversity problem. Because both of those are major, major challenges uh, in EMS today. And I think we have to invest in the community uh, more than we're actually doing. Well put, Chief. Well put. Well, on that note, thank you all again for watching today. It's been an honor to have Dr. Chief Moon to learn more about Freedom House. I also want to give a special thanks again to our sponsor, GEMS Training. As a reminder, this will be archived on gems.com slash webcasts within about a day, so you can share with your colleagues. Uh, after I sign off in about 20 seconds, a quick survey will appear on your screen for the audience. Please take a few moments to fill it out. We'd love to hear feedback. Chief, one last time, thank you. Keep spreading the news about Freedom House. Keep sharing triumphs of the group. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Chief. Thank you, Jeff, for this opportunity. You're helping me fulfill the desires of my heart, and I can't thank you enough. Thank you.